Hi there, this is your instructor Christina Howard for Histology, that's Biology 455-555 at Portland State University. Um, and this is the welcome slide, which I'm going to go ahead and skip for now because uh, I have rec tried to record this video like four times at this point and something keeps going wrong. So this is my last attempt um, and I'm going to skip the initial intro stuff just because I want to try and be sure that this actually makes it to the recording this time. So uh, skipping all this, we'll go through this in our in-person meeting in Zoom. Um, oh, just really quick before we start with that stuff, um, and this is also me testing whether my pen works or not, so let's try it. Yay, it does. Okay, so um, the person who initially created this PowerPoint presentation, which I am using and which I have tweaked a little bit, is Dr. Radhika Reddy. Uh, a fixed-term faculty member at Portland State University, so she was kind enough to give me her lecture material, um, which is uh, modifications of stuff that is based on the publisher-provided presentation material. Uh, she just compiled it and added information and made it look nice, and we figured, you know, why reinvent the wheel if there's already a slide set that exists, I can just tweak it to my style of content delivery um, without recreating the entire thing. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, she did a lot of the work on these PowerPoints and uh, deserves credit for it. So uh, going over here, uh, this uh, software I'm using at the right hand side of the screen is called Epic Pen. It's a tool for screen markup um, and I'll be using it throughout all of my recorded presentations this term. So um, just if you see the little uh, toolbar on the side, but that's what that is. Okay, so uh, tissue preparation, staining, and microscopy is the uh, topic set for chapter one. So assuming everything goes according to plan and I don't lose uh, any more content to my computer malfunctioning, uh, this lecture will go up through chapter one and then I'll call it for the day because <laughs> I've been talking to no one for a long time and I'm tired of it now. Okay, so uh, histology and its methods of study. So what we're talking about is uh, the level of uh, discrimination that we're capable of and that we'll be looking at this term and also how histology is done and why to do it in general. So switching over to my pen here, let's check to see if it works. Hooray, it does. And I'm gonna increase my dot size, there we go. Okay, so um, since this course is primarily about the histology of human tissues, uh, you can of course do histology on any number of organisms that are not humans, but ours really focuses on people. So um, it's important to just acknowledge that we're working in a specific size set of tissues, um, and that restricts us to a particular level of this organizational hierarchy. Um, which doesn't mean that you can forget total organism functionality, and it doesn't mean that you can forget atoms and molecules, it's just that we're primarily working at this level, which is the cells and sheets and groups of cells that build organs and tissues. So we're primarily operating in this bracket here. Context is important, so don't forget these or these, but what we will be directly observing and looking at using histology are the middle three primarily. So uh, what's in cells and how they contribute to the appearance of cells on a microscope, how cells come together to form tissues, and how tissues arrange themselves in an orderly fashion to form organs. Okay, so expanding on that a little bit, we've got uh, anatomical sciences divided up into categories and different folks who do anatomical science, uh, I'm one of them, tend to specialize in one of these areas or a variety of them. So gross anatomy and surface anatomy are uh, sort of the foundational components of anatomy. And that's because you know, all it takes to observe gross anatomy and surface anatomy is the ability to look at or feel a body structure. So, uh, you know, if you look at a person with your eyes, you can see that they have bilateral symmetry, they have hands and feet, a central area that's a trunk, um, and if you open that person up, you can see their organs as well. And so this is something that has been uh, going on for a really long time since the uh, ancient Greeks and before that even. Um, so probably since before recorded uh, communication, 
but regardless, people have known about organs and whatnot for quite a while. Same deal with surface anatomy. Histology, on the other hand, let's do some erasing here. Actually, I'll just go ahead and do that. Uh, histology is contingent upon access to a microscope, so we didn't have these until then. I hope I spelled Leeuwenhoek right. I'm not a Dutch scholar, so I don't know. I suspect that this might be an O, but I'm not sure. Um, Anyway, Antonin van, Le van Leeuwenhoek uh, is the guy who discovered and invented the microscope. So um, he figured out basically that if you put some spheres of glass in a row and look through them, uh, small things appear larger than they are to the naked eye, and then you can look at them. So that's uh, one piece of technology that has allowed humanity to advance scientifically. The other is the ability to section tissues very thinly. So we're primarily relying on light microscopy for our class, which means that you have to slice a tissue thin enough to be able to see through it, which means that light photons have to be able to pass through the tissue. And then we also have to stain them because cells and their organelles are transparent, so unless we dye them with special dyes, they don't show up. So histopathology is a possible career path for everybody in this course, and this is looking at tissues uh, and ex inspecting them for evidence of disease. So oftentimes uh, diseases like cancer and other problems, uh, before they manifest on the level of an organ system, begin at the level of the cell or at the tissue. And if a disorder is suspected, you can look at cells and tissues uh, by taking things like biopsies and other kinds of samples and observe them histologically to check for pathology. So that's where histo and path come together. So let's move on here. So here are two sections of tissue. Both of them are from a colon, and both of them are from a sample of a colon obtained during surgery. So in picture A, we see a frozen tissue section that has been stained with only one dye, and that's methylene blue. And this is pretty good, so I can see, for example, that this is the apical surface. I can see that I have intestinal crypts here. Um, these are also intestinal crypts. They're just the ends of ones that open to the top off screen. And I can see lamina propria here, which is rich with lymphatic tissue. And from this perspective in uh, tissue section A, even though I have relatively poor resolution compared with section B, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, I can see enough to say with relative confidence this is a normal colon section. And that's indeed uh, what was discovered by the pathologist as well. So over here, we have um, hematoxylin and eosin. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Basically, this is the idea that if you uh, do some extra steps and use more than one dye, you can get greater tissue resolution and you can see more things. So methylene blue obviously just stains things blue, whereas with H and E, they combine to give you pink and purple and varying shades therein which allows greater discrimination of the goings-on in the tissue at the time it was collected. So again, based on observing this, I can see uh, the mucosal cells look normal, the lamina propria looks normal, the histological arrangement of tissues and the locations of the cells, again, looks normal. So there is nothing out of place or amiss with this particular colon sample. So, how do you even get a picture like the ones I just showed you? Well, unsurprisingly, you can't just pull a chunk of tissue out of a person, slice it real thin, and slap it on a slide. You have to do some stuff to it first. So, the first step after collection is fixation. So basically, you have to make sure that the tissue is not going to physically or chemically degrade um, due to the action of, for example, enzymes that are already in the tissue that will degrade it. So these would be lysosomal enzymes. Um, and you basically do this by cross-linking proteins, which both preserves structural integrity of structural proteins and also inactivates enzymes. So it does two things at the same time. So uh, a lot of this fixation stuff involves formalin, 
uh, or some other cross-linking preservative structure. Dehydration is another important step, and that's because uh, another component of tissue degradation is chemical activity, both from endogenous enzymes inside the cells, which we've hopefully taken care of via fixation, um, but also uh, the ability of cells to swell and shrink in response to osmotic pressure and the fact that uh, not all of the bacteria, for example, that may be in or on the tissue sample will be inactivated by fixation. So since we know that uh, chemical reactions of life, biotic reactions, require water, if we take the water out, it's reasonable to suppose that we take the ability for those reactions to occur away as well. So basically what you do is dunk the tissue sample into a series of increasingly concentrated alcohol solutions. So maybe this one is 10% ethanol, ETOH is, is the abbreviation for ethanol, and this one is 30%, and this one is 60% on up to 100%, and by the time you get to 100, you can be reasonably certain that water has been removed from the tissue uh, and replaced with alcohol. But after that, you need to remove the alcohol too. So you do this using solvents like toluene. Um, this may be familiar to some of you. Toluene is a very good solvent. It's also a uh, chemical that is present in nail polish, enamel paints, varnish. So it's a volatile compound. Uh, it evaporates out of whatever it's in, leaving you with a shiny uh, coating behind, which is why it's used in the applications I just showed you. But it's also good for carrying alcohol away with it, which is why we use it in tissue clearing. All right, so infiltration is then you take paraffin wax, which is a special kind of wax, which has a pretty low melting point, so low enough that you're not going to additionally cook your tissue. Um, and then you just allow that to become liquid and infiltrate your tissue sample. So that helps to stabilize and preserve the tissue after it's been treated with other things so that you can then slice it. Once the tissue has been infiltrated, you put the liquid paraffin with the tissue inside of it into a mold and then you let it harden. And this permits you to trim the tissue using a uh, small knife called a microtome. So let's move on and look at the microtome. Alrighty, so here's a microtome. Um, this is basically a fixed blade. So here's the knife. So it's not the knife that moves, rather we're sliding the tissue block in its paraffin section past the knife in a very controlled way uh, so that I can really closely control the thickness of the tissue. So we've got a drive wheel and the drive wheel moves a block holder, which is what it sounds like, it holds the block. Uh, drive wheel moves that block up and down. So every time the drive wheel rotates, the block goes up and then back down. And as it comes back down, it passes the block containing the tissue past the knife and peels a very, very thin section off of it. Um, so the thickness that it's cut is equal to the amount that you've selected the block to advance forward towards you and towards the knife after each slice. So that's controlled very precisely by a computer. Um, so if you're, say, wanting to go for like a five micrometer, which we call microns, uh, slice thickness, you would plug that into this little keypad here, and then the microtome would automatically advance the block towards you by five nanometers every time the drive wheel completed a rotation. So after that's complete, you put the little sections, the thin slices that result on a glass slide, and you let them stick, then you take the paraffin away, and you stain them for light microscopy. So one thing that's important to note when you are doing histology is the fact that all the stuff that you're going to be looking at uh, has been rendered roughly two-dimensional by slicing it very thin, but all of the structures that we're going to be looking at were originally 3D, so you have to keep the 3D structure in mind uh, in order to understand the 2D structure of what you're looking at. So 
Um, as you can see over here, we've got a length of small intestine, and depending on the angle and plane of slice, you get a lot of different views of the intestine. Um, so for that reason, one single tissue or organ can look very different depending on uh, the angle and direction it is sliced. So when you're examining a section under a microscope, you also need to imagine what might be behind the field of view and what might be in front of it, so towards you, towards your eye, or away from your eye, based on your knowledge of the 3D structure, um, so that you can make accurate uh, descriptions and predictions of the tissue that you're seeing. Okay, so staining. If you remember your macrochemistry from uh, principles of biology, for example, you'll remember that the components that make up cell organelles are mostly carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, proteins, which are amino acids, so those are kind of the building blocks of life, and each of these have different chemical properties, right? So carbs are C, H, and O in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Nucleic acids have nitrogenous bases. Proteins have carboxyl and amino groups. So there are specific chemical uh, compounds that are specific to each kind of macromolecule, and these all have different chemical features like whether or not they're water soluble and whether or not they're acidic and basic, hydrophilic versus hydrophobic, maybe they're antipathic like phospholipids. So because of this different chemistry, you can use different dyes to target different cellular components, which gives you the ability to resolve distinct tissue components and make them pop out. So. Uh, this allows you to observe stuff that's usually colorless, but by virtue of chemistry, you can get dyes to stick to things and make them not colorless anymore. So the more simple dyes, uh, basic staining, uh, use pigments, and these are pigment chemicals that behave like acidic or basic compounds. So they either tend to be acidic or tend to be basic, which means that they're going to form salt bridges uh, with anything that's an ionizable radical in tissues. And of course, these are many, right? Because we know that um, a lot of uh, atoms, either singularly or ones that hang off of larger molecules, uh, really would like to gain or lose an electron and will do so readily, which allows them to form ionic bonds with other compounds, specifically these compounds. Okay, so I mentioned hematoxylin and eosin earlier, and this is the one that you'll see most frequently. It's the one that yields the sort of pink and purple color. So hematoxylin is almost basic. Um, we'll discuss what almost means uh, a little bit later in the course. More specifically, you'll look at it in lab, but for now, think of it as just being basic. So because it is nearly basic, it tends to want to conjugate with acidic things. So opposites attract, acids and bases tend to conjugate. That's the whole basis of buffer systems after all. Um, so hematoxylin tends to stick to acidic structures inside of the cell. Um, so nucleic acids, for example, tend to be acidic. And because of that, um, the hematoxylin tends to like to stick to and darken the nuclei and anywhere that is DNA or RNA rich. Eosin is the other one. This is more acidic and this stains other cytoplasmic components and also collagen pink. So this brings us to the idea of acidophils and basophils. So this is a way of naming cells and uh, it's not limited to one tissue. So you'll see like acidophils and basophils in the pituitary gland and acidophils and basophils in the uh, adrenal gland, for example. So this is just a way to talk about cells on terms of whether they like eosin or whether they like hematoxylin. So basophils tend to be dark purple staining cells and these are ones that like hematoxylin. They have a lot of stuff that hematoxylin sticks to and acidophils are the 
opposite scenario. So these tend to be uh, bright pinkish orange in appearance and they are that way because eosin likes to stick to them. So it's just a couple of terms to watch out for as you go forward in the class. Okay, periodic acid shift reagent. Uh, this is one that's often used in conjunction with hematoxylin and eosin. Uh, and I'm going to abbreviate it by saying pass reagent because periodic acid shift reagent every single time is kind of a mouthful. So the pass reaction is based on um, basically taking sugars that are hanging off of cells. So uh, cells have a glycocalyx, which consists of glycoproteins and glycolipids. And so uh, anything that has glyco in it means that there is a carbohydrate component to it. So anything that is rich in glycoproteins or glycolipids is going to uh, basically show up strongly with the pass reagent. So um, any sugar that is present, if it has a 1 comma 2 glycol group, and I want to remind you that although it makes the word look scary, 1 comma 2 means that there's a glycol on the first and second carbons in that sugar. So 1 comma 2 just tells you the carbon position of whatever follows 1, 2. So it changes these into aldehyde residues, and aldehyde residues uh, react with the Schiff reagent, and that turns that conjugate a purplish magenta color. So you can see the basement membrane here and all of these kind of interstitial spaces here are rich with carbohydrates, and so the pass reagent has turned them bright magenta. Um, so pass positive basement membranes and the epithelium of the Bowman's capsule as well as the kidney tubules are all surrounded with uh, pass positive stuff. So. I mentioned that hematoxylin and ESN are often used in conjunction with PASS, so here is H&E only, and you can see that the mucin in this goblet cell, G stands for goblet cell, uh, mucin is the protein that mixes with water to make mucus, so goblet cells are responsible for making that, uh, and mucus has lots of uh, carbohydrates in it, and so do the apical surface of cells. So over here in the PASS plus h &E, you can see that the uh, glycoproteinaceous portions of mucus, as well as the tops of the cells, are all darkly magenta stained, which makes those carb-rich places of the cell really pop compared with over here where they're relatively faint. So that's kind of the advantage of the PASS stain compared with others. All right, enzyme histochemistry uh, basically takes advantage of the fact that, you know, enzymes are the workhorse of the cell. You can expect there to be a lot of enzymes in the cell, and it's unreasonable to suppose that all enzymes are active in every place in the cell because enzymes have specific jobs and they tend to do those specific jobs at the specific location where they're required. So if you are a scientist who's curious about where in a cell specific enzymes do their job, you can use enzyme histochemistry to try and find that out. So this is what we're seeing in this picture over here at the left. So this is another picture of a kidney tubule. And here, this histochemist was looking for alkaline phosphatase activity. So alkaline phosphatases um, are basically a group of enzymes that are dealing with uh, phosphate metabolism in general. Um, they're a group of enzymes, so I can't be more specific than that. But basically, if you're looking for areas where phosphate metabolism is high, you could look for alkaline phosphatases. And in fact, in this position on the kidney, you can see that the tubules, let me outline a tubule for you. So this is a cross section of one tubule, here's another. And then the lumen is in the middle. So the darkly staining areas that are flanking the lumen is going to be the apical surface of all of these cells. So you can see that in each individual cell, so let's take this one for example, the alkaline phosphatase activity here where I'm pointing to is very low versus over here in the black area 
is very high. So even within a cell, I can see that there is non-homogeneous activity of that enzyme inside of the cell. So how do you do this? Well, basically, you are looking for an enzyme that is known, and you take a solution that contains the substrate of that enzyme. So whatever the substrate is, whatever the enzyme is going to act on, you make a solution rich in that stuff, and then you put the tissue section in it. And the expectation is that the enzyme is going to act on the substrate, so that's step two. After that, you should be able to chemically predict what the product is based on known reaction chemistry. And so you're going to know about the product's characteristics. Is it hydrophilic? Is it hydrophobic? Is it acidic? Is it basic? Those kinds of things. And you can design a marker compound to stick to whatever that is. So the final product is then going to have either color or electron density that is larger than the surrounding tissue. And that precipitates over where the enzyme is active, causing contrast, this should say contrast, not contract, between enzymatically active and inactive areas. So that's what that's talking about. So let's, oh, no, I want to delete all that and go back to my cursor. There we go. Okay, so immunocytochemistry, also sometimes called immunohistochemistry, uh, this is contingent upon some important immune molecules that you need to know about called antibodies. So um, one mistake students often make, because most students had, haven't had much immunology yet, is to think of antibodies as... Um, a cell. So there's a common misconception that antibodies are alive and they have agency. They really don't. So an antibody is a protein. They're Y-shaped. And the whole point of an antibody is to stick to a specific thing. And because antibodies are just proteins, if you know about the chemistry of the antigen, you can design an antibody that has an epitope. An epitope is a special name for the area of an antibody that is specific to its substrate. An epitope that sticks only to the antigen. So there's kind of a lock and key relationship between the antibody and the antigen. So in a lot of cases, there are already existing antibodies for the antigen, and all you need to do to uh, get them is to harvest them typically out of an animal. So if you go online to like Thermo Fisher Scientific and order antibodies that are labeled, uh, you'll see words like uh, murine anti-MEL1A. So murine means it comes from a mouse, Anti means it's an antibody, and MEL1A means that that antibody is supposed to stick to melatonin receptor 1A. So it's kind of the notation that these are given. So we have direct or indirect immunofluorescence. Direct is pretty simple. You take a dye molecule called a fluorophore. And this is something that fluoresces under UV light. If you glue that fluorophore to an antibody, the antibody's epitopes are gonna stick to the antigen. And then when you shine UV light on it, which is what this represents, the fluorophore lights up. So you can see where in the tissue your antigen is. Now, let's say that you expect there to be very little of the antigen in the tissue, meaning that the amount of fluorescence is gonna be relatively small you may choose to do indirect immunofluorescence instead, which amplifies the signal. So now, instead of having, over here we've had a one-to-one -one ratio of fluorophore to antigen. Here we have a two-to-one ratio of fluorophore to antigen, so even bigger. And you can actually make this much larger as well. So indirect immunofluorescence operates on the same principle, which is antibody specificity, but it's good for signal amplification. So that's the reason why. Okie dokie. So 
moving on. Um, here's an example. So if you combine two different fluorophores that are targeting two different antigens, you can uh, establish an important idea and that is co-localization. So observing areas in a cell where two things exist in the same place. So in this case, we have lactate transporter MCT1 um, that we're looking for, and there's an antibody against it. So this antibody is conjugated, meaning it's joined to uh, a fluorophore called rhodamine, which uh, lights up red. So for example, you can see down in here, in this section of the cell, and especially there and there, there's a lot of this particular lactate transporter. So lactate transporters are important for getting lactic acid out of a cell uh, so it doesn't damage the cell. Over here, we have green, and green is for transmembrane protein CD147. Um, we're not going to go into the physiology of these two things right now. Uh, I'm just showing you an example of co-localization. So anywhere that expresses CD147, uh, the antibody is labeled with fluorescein, which is a green fluorophore, and that area is going to light up green. Uh, in light or fluorescent microscopy, yellow is not its own fluorophore. It's actually red plus green. So anywhere that shows up as being yellow is a place where there's both CD147 and the lactate transporter. So co-localization is an important step in observing processes because if you, you can infer that if two things are present in the same place, then a set of reactions or happenings uh, co-occurs in that place as well. Alrighty, hybridization. So this one is <laughs> difficult to get to work. Um, if you've ever tried in situ hybridization, for example, you know that. So in situ means in the cell. Um, so in order to do that, you basically have to take a probe that is made out of nucleotides, so nucleic acids. Um, and what you're wanting it to do is to anneal or hybridize to mRNA that are in the cell. So this is based on the principle of complementary base pairing. So if I'm looking for an mRNA whose sequence is G, C, C, U, G, I'm going to design a probe that is G, C, G, A, C. So this is mRNA of interest. That's what I'm looking for. And this might be probe. And then if I want my probe to light up, I got to add a fluorophore to it. So maybe I'm going to add fluorescein, which is green. So let me glue a little green guy on there. So now when my probe sticks to my mRNA of interest and then I shine some UV light on it, it lights up green and then I can see where in the cell my mRNA of interest exists. So let's look at an example here. So um, one application for this technology is in prenatal screening. Um, so prenatal screening employs oftentimes, but not always, a procedure called amniocentesis. which is where a large needle is inserted into the uterus and into the amniotic sac to extract amniotic fluid to be tested by clinicians. So amniotic fluid and the cells contained therein can give important information about what's going on with the fetus. Uh, it's not a procedure that's without risk, but under certain circumstances, knowing is better than not knowing, and so the risk is assumed by the mom voluntarily to make sure that their uh, developing fetus is okay. So. Um, here we have an example of a prenatal screening test that is for trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So you can actually design whole chromosome probes, which are going to stick to chromosomes of interest. If we know which genes are on which chromosomes, we can design probes against those chromosomes and have them stick. So one of these two cells, let's label them A and B, one of these two cells is the cell from a fetus that has Down syndrome. The other one is not. So I'll let you take a moment to look at the two of them and try and figure out which A or B exhibits trisomy 21. So pause here and take a moment to think about that and then resume when you're ready. So I'm just gonna go right ahead and uh, resume for you. And the answer is very clearly A. 
So if we look, the orange probe is for chromosome 21 and the green or reference probe is for chromosome 13. So for some reason, uh, most of the time it's chromosome 21 that ends up being duplicated, not other chromosomes. So there are other trisomies um, that exist that are less common. A lot of them are less common because they simply aren't survivable, uh, meaning the embryo spontaneously aborts before pregnancy is detected. Um, or before amniocentesis has a chance to occur. So um, it's not that other chromosomes don't experience aneuploidy, it's just that uh, trisomy 21 happens to result in viable fetuses, which means it can be tested for later in pregnancy as opposed to other kinds of aneuploidies, which can't. So if we count the number of orange blobs over here in A, we have one, two, three. Um, and so this particular cell is 3n for, tri for chromosome 21 and 2n for chromosome 13, whereas b is 2n for both 21 and 13. So this is the normal condition. This is aneuploidy. Aneuploid just means incorrect amount of DNA. It can be too much, it can be too little. And my battery is running low, so. Um, so we're going to talk about microscopy next, and I'm going to take a minute to plug my computer back in, so bear with me, there might be some jostling. There we go. Okay. So this also means that my uh, ability to write on the screen is going to be a little bit impaired because I've been using uh, my computer in tablet mode and now it's back to being a laptop, so if my handwriting gets cruddy, I'm sorry. So light microscopy is the primary mode of microscopy that you'll be using this term. Uh, obviously you won't be using it directly because we're not meeting in person in the lab, but the uh, website and the pictures that you have access to are um, images from bright field light microscopy. So that's your primary uh, thing you'll be looking at. We also have phase contrast, fluorescence, confocal, electron, atomic forces, and virtual. Uh, most of what we will be doing is talking about and looking at these things. We will address atomic forces microscopy and virtual a little bit, but not for a while. So the bracketed terms are going to be our primary focal point for this stuff. Um, where is this? Let me go here. Okay, so one reason to pick a particular microscopic technique is based on resolving powers. So if you want to observe really small things, you need more resolving power because you have to be able to tell the difference between thing one and thing two. So resolving power is defined as the distance by which two objects have to be separated in order to be seen as two objects. So this is an issue of resolution. Um, the human eye is pretty good. We can see about two uh, tenths of a millimeter. Bright field microscopy allows us to get down to 0.2 micrometers, so a thousandth of a millimeter is a micron or micrometer. So this Greek character mu, oh, I like the pencil, there we go. So mu is used to denote that. And then even smaller scanning electron microscopy or transmission electron can get you down to the nanometer level. So if I want to look at stuff that is inside of cells, I would probably pick transmission electron microscopy. Whereas if I want to look at the whole cells of a tissue, bright field light microscopy is just fine. And for most intents and purposes, clinically, bright field microscopy is sufficient. Uh, so scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy tend to be more experimental and research. And bright field microscopy is both of these things, but also heavily used in clinical applications. And I mentioned I'm using my computer as a laptop now, which means that the uh, handwriting is going to degrade a little bit. So I'm sorry about that. Okay, so light microscopy. Um, primarily this term we're going to use bright field microscopy, which is just, so I'm using my laser pointer here, 
Um, this is where you have a very, very thin sectioned tissue and you stained it and light passes up through the tissue, which is on the stage here, and goes through a series of lenses and mirrors until it reaches your eye. So if we look down here, we can see we have a light source. And then it passes through a convex lens called a condenser. So before the condenser, if you zoom in a little bit here, you can see that the light rays coming through the lens associated with the field diaphragm, uh, they are diverging, meaning that they go from a small point and they're, they're diverging away from that. We don't want that because we need to focus all that light uh, on the tissue. So you use a convex lens to bend those light rays back towards the auxiliary condenser lens. So basically you're taking all those photons and you're bending them and funneling them towards the thing you're trying to look at. The objective lens is on the nose piece of the microscope and these have magnifications like 10x, 20x, 40x, 100x. The x denotes um, how many times larger that particular objective makes the tissue appear. So 40x means it makes it appear 40 times bigger, for example. So this magnifies with a series of lenses. And then we have the observation tubes and some lenses that just help funnel and direct the light. So you notice there's not a change here. Um, and then that directs the image up to the eyepiece, which has its own magnification. So typically the objective lenses have various magnification powers. The ocular lenses typically in a student's microscope have 10x. So total magnification is usually 10 x, which is the ocular magnification, times whatever objective you're using. So if this one happens to be the 20x objective, 10 times 20 equals 200. So my total magnification would be 200 times larger than normal. So that's how you do that calculation. OK, so let's say that you want to observe a living cell. Uh, living cells are transparent, and the problem with observing living cells is that, well, if you stain them, they tend to die. Because in order to stain them, you have to put cells through the process I showed you previously, where you fix the tissue in formalin, um, and that results in cell death. So if you want to observe living cells, which are transparent, you can, but you can't dye them or color them anyway. Fortunately, though, the way our eye works, we are able to detect light and dark areas thanks to our rods, which are the kind of light catching cell that uh, transduces light versus dark or shades of gray or black. Um, and the angle at which light strikes the eye gives the brightness and the darkness. So if you can change the angle um, at which light is passing through something, you can uh, basically use that principle to resolve edges and discriminate, and we call this phase contrast. So this uses the different refractive indices of various cell and tissue components uh, to produce an image without staining. So refraction just means the bending of the angle of a photon as it passes through a solid medium. And so refractive index is proportional to density of the material, and let's draw that. So. Our eye is proportional to, that almost infinity symbol means proportional to, uh, density. So more dense areas are going to have a higher refractive index, less dense area, areas are going to have a lower refractive index. Um, and you can observe this if you can compare image A over here, where I can just pretty much see pigment granules and then kind of ghosts of other cells. If I up the phase contrast by artificially enhancing the refractive index, I see a whole world of cells popping out that I couldn't see previously. So these are actually the same two images. So you can tell because this corresponds to that and this guy corresponds to this. Um, but if you look at A, you can see there's a bunch of stuff you can't see that over here in B you can. So even though it doesn't look quite as fancy as, say, staining with hematoxylin and eosin, you can definitely see a lot more just by using phase contrast versus just straight up looking through the microscope uh, of live cells that have been unstained. So it's powerful.
Okay, fluorescent microscopy. This uses ultraviolet light, so any dye or pigment that is fluorescent uh, only shows up uh, as glowing under ultraviolet light. So you've already seen this actually um, when I showed you direct versus indirect uh, immunocytochemistry. Um, the example pictures contain fluorophores. That's not the only way to do immunocytochemistry, so you can glue other things besides fluorophores to antibodies in order to make the tissue stain. It's just that fluorescence microscopy is fairly powerful, so that's what we tend to use. Um, so basically, depending on what thing you want to stain, you can order antibodies with various fluorophores conjugated to them. So for example, uh, this pigment right here, DAPI, which is 4,6-diamino-2-phenylindole. Um, this is a compound that fluoresces blue and it binds DNA, so it's typically used in fluorescence microscopy to resolve nuclei, and you can see that here. So this is a lawn of cultured cells. The green is actin filaments, which are cytoskeletal elements, and the blue is DAPI. So if we go down here, we can see there's a link to an article that concerns this. I'm not going to read it to you here, but it's of interest. And then let's move right along. So as you can see over here, this is kidney cells. Again, they look a lot different from the H&E stains. Uh, these are basically showing you areas that are rich in RNA. Okay, so confocal microscopy involves basically doing the tissue in layers and layers. And that layers and layers allows you to use a computer after you've done the detection, uh, use a computer to reconstruct a 3D image from taking a series of slices from uh, sequential 2D scans. So basically here your light source is a laser and instead of having the light come up through the slide to your eye, the laser shines down through a beam splitter and a lens, and that allows you to scan at a particular depth. Now it's important to note, although we slice tissues very thin, they're not two-dimensional, so they do have depth, and the smaller you go with uh, microscopic resolution, the thicker the tissue's relative thickness appears. So you can move up and down within the thickness of the tissue, to get various layers of cells, and then you can have a computer put those together to form a pretty robust 3D image, which is powerful because it gives you uh, a, a more holistic picture of the lives of cells that you can get in just uh, 2D light microscopy. Electron microscopy, as I mentioned, is more commonly used with um, things like experimental investigations, uh, so research and development. It's not typically used diagnostically, except for in very few cases. So like I said, usually light microscopy is, is sort of good enough for that. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not very cool because you can use TEM to look at stuff that's literally inside of cells. Uh, light microscopy can't do that. So basically, this uses beams of electrons rather than light. So remember, electrons are uh, high energy particles that whiz around the nucleus of an atom. They are negatively charged and they are of negligible mass. So if you can manipulate those um, based on their charge and their weight, you can examine uh, where there are electron dense regions in a cell and that's going to differentially stain the tissue uh, with the help of heavy metal ions. So basically transmission EM requires that you slice the tissue very thin. So usually you have to freeze it first and then slice it. Um, and once you've sliced it, you have to add heavy metal ions. Um, so these are things that are often radioisotopes like iodine, um, and these associate at different electron densities with cell and tissue components. So different parts of the cell have different electron densities, and the metal ions are gonna stick to those preferentially, which uh, basically allows you to discriminate between very, very tiny things. So, for example, the pictures that I've been showing you are of groups of cells, and you can mostly usually see like the cell border in the nucleus, and that's about it. This is one part of a cell. So this is specifically an intestinal absorptive cell, and I'm showing you the apical region, meaning 
top. Now I'm drawing with my mouse, which is even worse. So if I take my pen here, uh, so this is the surface, and these are microvilli. And then down here is the inside of the cell. And you can see there's a lot going on in there. So in this specimen, uh, iodine-125, so it's an isotope of iodine, was bound to nerve growth factor. So oftentimes you can conjugate a heavy metal with some kind of compound, in this case nerve growth factor. Um, this was injected into the animal, and then the tissue was removed from the animal one hour later. So uh, basically what the scientists were looking for was, okay, so if you inject nerve growth factor, Obviously, it's a signaling factor, so it has to bind to receptors. Um, so that suggests that it needs to bind somewhere. So we want to see where it goes in the animal. So we're just going to give it a little old injection. Uh, blood goes everywhere, so blood will carry that labeled nerve growth factor to where it needs to be. And then if we take slices of cells, we can look for where in the cell that nerve growth factor is localizing to or going to. So after that happens, uh, you prepare similarly for light microscopy. And then you add silver grains. So silver grains, uh, this is a technique that's similar to silver photoemulsion, which is a photography technique, but that helps you to localize the uh, location of the heavy iodine nerve growth factor complexes. The silver grains kind of precipitate out in the location where these things are. And then you can see all of these dark tangles are areas that are positive for the nerve growth factor. Um, and you can see that they're close to apical invaginations and early endosomes. So both of these things, uh, apical means top, and invagination is an infolding of the membrane. And then early endosomes, an endosome is a uh, membrane-enclosed bubble inside of the cell that's a result of endocytosis. So endocytosis starts with apical invagination. Uh, the cell membrane dips in and begins to close off, and then early endosomes are what happens right after the pinching off of those apical invaginations. So this is basically showing you that this intestinal cell is gathering up uh, this nerve growth factor that's been uh, injected into the animal. Come on. Okay, scanning electron microscopy. This has a little bit uh, lower resolving power than transmission. So transmission's theoretical limit is uh, 0.05 nanometers, but once you send it, sort of assign it to an image uh, processor, it ends up being about 2.5 nanometers or so. Um, but electron microscopy is not limited to TEM. You can also look at whole cells, and that's where SEM comes in. Uh, so in this case, the specimen is coated with a thin layer of heavy metal rather than having it injected. And then basically you, again, aim an electron at it. And the images that result are projected off, so uh, reflected in secondary electrons from the image are processed into an ultrastructural image. So reflected means electrons that are coming from the electron gun traveling through all of this and then bouncing off to the detector. Secondary electrons are ones which have actually been kicked off of the atoms of the tissue itself. So one consequence of hitting uh, materials with ionizing radiation is that electrons bounce off from the tissue. And so some of the electrons that uh, result in the SEM image are actually ones that were originally members of the atoms of the tissue. Others are ones that are simply reflected off. Okay, so zooming back out uh, for context, we can see that if we look at the zone that light microscopy covers, most applications, both clinical and research, are achievable with simple light microscopy. So light microscopy has a pretty good range. Um, note that this is a logarithmic scale, so we're having orders of magnitude rather than a linear scale. Bacteria are really, really tiny. They require very, very high magnifications. Um, plant and animal cells are about 10 times larger on average than most bacteria, so they're pretty easy to see with light microscopy as well, but it doesn't mean you can't see uh, bacteria with light microscopy. It just means that you need higher magnification power. So electron microscopy 
overlaps significantly with light, but because electron microscopy is more complicated and also very much more expensive, uh, this zone of overlap usually gives over to light microscopy with the exception of certain applications. So uh, most cells are microscopic. Some of them you can actually see with your naked eye. Typically those are gametes like the eggs. Um, and then anything that's down here in the molecular sort of zone, viruses, ribosomes, cell organelles, etc., these require electron microscopy to resolve. Okay, and we've made it to chapter two, so this is where I'm going to stop. Hopefully my video actually recorded this time. So the next thing I record for you will be talking about the stuff that's inside of cells. So with that, I bid you a good day, and I will catch you next video.